and welcome to another episode of The Back Brief. I'm Rod Rodriguez. Uh, we are at the midpoint of December. God, does it... Everybody's waiting for 2021, man. I know we are. We all feel like 2021 is going to show up and it's going to be a brand new beginning, fresh start. COVID will go away. Uh, new president, new life, new everything. But let's not forget that it's just a a, a day in a calendar. 2021 may end up being worse than 2020 itself. I don't think anything is going to happen at midnight on January. Let's hope not. I think if anything happens, it'll probably be bad. But it is what it is, and we are going to get through it all together. On this show, I'm talking with uh, one of the co-hosts of a podcast, one of my favorite podcasts, Pod is a Woman. You got to check it out, Darian Page. Great podcast, but she's on the show. We're going to be talking about the presidential elections, the Biden camp taking over. What does it mean? How does this all work? And we're going to be talking about the, the COVID vaccine because those two things have a lot to do with each other. What does this COVID vaccine mean for this administration? How will this work? And will you be forced to take it? And then I have on the show, Elizabeth Howe from Connecting Vets. We're going to be talking about this new report that just came out about Fort Hood. All the bad stuff that's going on that happened down there. Uh, an independent committee got together, they did the review, and it was so shocking. People got fired, top to bottom. It, it's all been a crazy week for Fort Hood. But what does this mean for the fort itself? What does this mean for the Army? And you might be shocked. Oh, maybe you might not be that shocked about what they had to say about the Army SHARP program. My first guest is an Army veteran herself and a co-host of the popular podcast, Pod is a Woman, Darian Page. Darian, thanks for being on the show. I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, you worked on the uh, in the Obama administration. We have gone through what can only be called the opposite of the Obama administration. <laughs> That's this right. It's been a, 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 an interesting set of years. Um, we are about to enter this transition period. There's still all this upheaval. Did Trump win the elections? Will he win? He's still it just uh, today or yesterday, I believe, uh, answering a question about COVID response. He said, well, it's going to depend on which administration is going to handle this, mine or his. Um, he's still convinced that he could still win this. Where are we, uh, Miss Page? W w what are we doing with this? <laughs> um, it is a really strange time. I feel like we're we are living in two different realities, one where... President-elect Biden has been rightfully elected with a significant amount of the popular vote and the electoral vote, and all of these elections are being certified as they should be. And then you turn on Fox News or OWN or hear President Trump speak, and you think, did I miss something? And I talk, when I compare the two administrations, we came in with the Obama administration on a sea of hope and change. And this is just fear and instability. And the American people deserve more right now. I, we are going through a collective trauma in the way that we're dealing with COVID and the level of death and unprecedented sickness that we're seeing is something that you would hope that a leader would come in and want to immediately address and handle and be responsible and show empathy for what the American people are going through. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that from President Trump. And what I would hope would be that there would be a sense of dignity that he tries to you know, leave the um, White House with, but I don't think that we'll have that. Big thing on everybody's mind right now is the vaccines. It is. Uh, president-elect Biden, uh, you know, when he comes into office, he will be the president. That's the guy uh, whose office, the buck, literally stops there. Right. This is an immense responsibility and an uh you know, we haven't had a pandemic since, you know, what, like the 20s, the Spanish flu, something. The Spanish like, flu. Spanish flu. So we are looking at a uh, immunization project, a, a, a something of, of, of uh, logistics we have never done in America, to my knowledge. 
maybe I'm wrong. There's always some history guy that's like, well, as a matter of fact, in 19... There like, was okay. this one time. <laughs> this one time. To my knowledge, we have never uh, taken on this level of a logistics problem before. Uh, what, you know, what is what can this new president expect? And what's the plan, to your knowledge, politically, to get this thing going? Everybody gets it. Well, you know, I think we had a really interesting conversation yesterday with Dr. Dot from the World Health Organization um, and on our podcast, and we talked about how you start to distribute this, how you start to gain the American trust when we are in a period of significant distrust, and especially in communities of color, as we're dealing with this reckoning of racial injustice, how do we make it a approachable for them to uh, really want to take this vaccine and trust that the government is doing this for their best interest and the best interest of the American people as a whole and who gets it is which essential workers get it is it the postal carriers is it the people in the hospitals when do we start to really roll this out and president-elect Biden is a challenging situation on his hands, but to see him already start to come to the table with a healthcare team that is incredibly diverse, that you know is bringing men and women from across the country that are the leaders in their field, that he is listening to scientists and doctors and medical professionals to help him as and advise him on the best way to do it and to start off the strategy with that perspective. Um, the National Health Institute and the military have both said several times, they've been very vehement about the statement, the military will not be administering this vaccine. The only thing the military will be doing is the logistics behind it. Now, if, it, if they'd have said it once or twice, I get it. But this is a statement, this is a message that the government, the military, uh, the NHI, everybody's very vehement about saying, the army will not be administering, we're only handling. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that message is so important to get to the American people? Why does this message keep being pounded in our heads that we're not administering, we're just logistics guys in this? So that's an interesting question. And I hadn't actually considered that perspective before. Uh, but my first take on that would be, number one, the military has a lot on their plates right now. <laughs> There are threats when we look at just from a national security perspective, there is so much going on. But also we've seen President Trump try and politicize the military with this, you know, the, the parade that he wanted to have to show the military might instead of utilizing the military as it should be. And because the vaccine and because the pandemic as a whole has been so politicized, you never want to bring the military into that. This is the military is nonpartisan. It is here for the protection of American people. And once you start politicizing it, you're going down a very slippery slope. So I would hope that that would remain true, that they would not force that on our service members. If you can imagine if someone is against having the vaccine, having the military come into your community and force that upon you just seems like the wrong, wrong approach when there are so many other approaches to take. I'm interested in knowing you, you brought up the politicization. I hope I said that word correctly. Mm -hmm. The politicization of the American uh, service member. Do you think something's been learned about this process, about this this act of turning the military into something political. We've seen numerous generals, we've seen numerous service members leave the administration, uh, General Mattis being the most notable. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think Biden is gonna be taking a very different approach to how the DOD or service members are portrayed or used politically? Absolutely. I mean, he has to, and you can you can only contrast a father of two military service members, a father of an Iraq war veteran, coming into office with the most foreign policy experience of any, 
president that's ever held the office, his perspective on how we use the military in general is going to be radically different than what you've seen from President Trump. And to see there's something so honorable about serving your country. And to see President Trump describe military service members as losers and to hear him disparage them while also wanting to use them to show his military might, the way that President Biden will approach how he, you know, converses with his military leadership, the guidance that he's getting, the relationship that he has with our world leaders and global democracies is going to be so completely different than what we've seen now. And I think that service members across the globe can really breathe a sigh of relief in knowing that there is an adult in the room and an adult who has had the experience of leading at some of the highest levels in the world. He was the chairman of foreign service for two times at this point. He's known all of these global leaders for most of his, you know, 40 year career. So yes, I do think that it will be completely different than what we've seen over the past four. I will say that uh, President Trump's the 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 accusations and the the are only accusations that he said uh, losers and whatnot about the military. I, I will say that that is something that he did not that is not on the record. We don't know that he said that, but uh, he has said some pretty dispersing things about uh, 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 the now deceased Senator McCain. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say whether he said it or not, but I would say it's not that far fetched. Uh, my final question to you is, is in regards to uh, the current state of international affairs, uh, the current state of the military in regards to our positions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Iran, just we just, you know, the, one of their scientists just got uh, murdered. We don't know how this is going to affect our relations or, or our position in that area of the world. President Trump wants to bring him home. Will Biden abide? by that do you think he's going to bring them back home or are we there to stay and, and do more no i don't think america is looking to stay engaged in forever wars i do think he will take you know the advice of his military leadership he will take the advice of the experts and he will use his own experience to help him as he devises a plan for a drawdown in Afghanistan. I think he will look to, you know, strengthen our relationship with NATO, given all of the um, challenges that have they've had. He will look to strengthen our relationship and our alliances across the globe, and he will use that as a way to utilize the diplomacy and bring home our um, service members. So I, th I think that we will, he will find a path out of Afghanistan. Um, well, that is my hope. At least. Darian Page, thank you so much for being on the show. Where can we learn more about you and Pod as a Woman? Um, you can learn more about Pod as a Woman. Um, we are on wherever you get your um, podcast on Apple Podcast or um, radio.com. So that is all available. And I am at Darian Page on all of the social handles, Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. Thank you again for being on the show. And uh, we'll be right back. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I know on the back brief, we tend to talk about stories that range from the serious to absurd, but I want to share with you a different kind of podcast. CBS Eye on Veterans, hosted by Navy veteran Phil Briggs, brings you uplifting, inspirational, and sometimes hilarious stories from the veteran world. From Matt Best talking pounds of brown to the greatest beer run ever, Phil Briggs is going to take you to the best and funniest places in the veteran world. CBS Eye on Veterans, available everywhere you listen to podcasts or go to ConnectingVets.com. Click on the podcast button at the top of the page. CBS Eye on Veterans. Folks, my next guest is Connecting Vets reporter Elizabeth Howe, uh, and she is covering a story that has been developing throughout this year, and it really began with the tragic death of Vanessa Guillen, and it's kind of uh, gotten more and more uh, prolific with more and more soldiers' deaths and accidents coming out of Fort Hood. Elizabeth has covered uh, training accidents 
from Fort Hood. And this kind of all, it, it seems to all kind of gel into the overall climate. Uh, Elizabeth, what's going on at Fort Hood? So the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, in August ordered an independent review of Fort Hood. Independent review. No military, no current commanders at the installation. They wanted a team that was a little bit of a, a degree of separation away from the installation so that they could hopefully get an objective report. That report was released yesterday, and it was ugly. None of us really expected great news out of this report, but it was brutal. It was sharp is ineffective. It's the leader's fault. And it wasn't, the report itself was pretty objective. This committee was not out to get Fort Hood. The evidence was just there. And there were nine findings that range from the SHARP program is ineffective to Army CID is ineffective to the leadership there cult built a pervasive culture that encouraged individuals to not report sexual assault or sexual harassment. And then the report included 70 recommendations. 70 recommendations to improve the situation at Fort Hood. There was a lot in the report that individually I don't think would have surprised anyone. After this year, even the civilian population is kind of aware that there are some sketchy things going on at Fort Hood. But this 150 page report that put all of that ugliness in one place was just pretty overwhelming, even for those of us that were waiting for the report and expecting this outcome. Let's talk about the SHARP program. Uh, the report says SHARP is, in effect, is ineffective. So where does that leave the SHARP program? Does it mean that the SHARP program is no longer effective in the sense overall, like, hey, SHARP is, is terrible? Or is it saying the SHARP program at Fort Hood was ineffective? So that was a big topic of conversation during the briefings yesterday, because what does that mean exactly, right? So. The committee was careful to say that they cannot generalize their findings to the SHARP program in general because they were on the ground at Fort Hood. So they didn't wanna say SHARP at every installation is ineffective. They had very clear data as to why SHARP at Fort Hood was ineffective. But even McCarthy said that this data has kind of opened the Army's eyes to maybe we should be looking at SHARP at other installations, these problems could very easily be systemic. And the report also said that the sharp structure is flawed. So yes, the report was on Fort Hood. Yes, it looked specifically at Fort Hood's sharp program, but the implication and the possibility is there that this might be army-wide. And out of the 70 recommendations that the report made, almost half of them had to do with the SHARP program. 32 of the 70 recommendations were how to fix SHARP at Fort Hood specifically, but, you know, the Army in general. This report comes out and immediately people are fired. Take us through who's gotten fired and is this, what? what's the response to these firings? Uh, so something that was encouraging is that the commanding general at Fort Hood, Lieutenant General Pat White, was not among the 14 leaders who were relieved or suspended. The 14 included two major generals, but the commanding general of Fort Hood was not relieved. And there were a lot of questions about that. Lieutenant General White was deployed for nine months within the review period. And so the army was very careful to say that Lieutenant General White was in Afghanistan doing this. And the commanding general that was left in his place was doing this. It made me believe that they are looking closely at exactly what leaders were doing what. And they're looking at leaders because the Fort Hood report pointed very clearly to there are problems with the sharp structure, there's problems with this, there's problems with that, but a lot of it fell on leadership. A lot of it was leaders are not instilling these values. Leaders are not making sure that these policies are trickling down. A lot of the blame in this report fell on the leaders. And so the army immediately looked at the leaders concerned and 14 of them were relieved or suspended, but leaders who were not at Fort Hood during the period of review were not, such as Lieutenant General White. Did anything come out of this investigation that could directly impact uh, the Vanessa Guillen situation 
or any of the other open investigations that are currently taking place on Fort Hood. We're still looking for the murder, I believe, of Brandon Rosencrantz. Uh, did this uh, did this illuminate any of those situations? So Sharp was a huge part of the report, but another huge part of the report was Army CID at Fort Hood and its flaws, and it has a lot of them. And the flaws have to do with staffing and experience and resources. And at the end of the day, that was hindering Army CID from solving crimes. And so those those resource shortages and staff shortages are being mitigated, they're being addressed, which you would hope means that those open cases that haven't been solved will be expedited a little because now we understand, okay, Army CID at Fort Hood needs help. Here's more resources, here's more staff, here's more experience, but you know, there's, there's kind of a delay on when policies get implemented and when the effects of those policies really start to show up. So you would hope that these open cases at Fort Hood would start to get some sort of resolution. In the case of Vanessa Guillen, her family was involved in the Fort Hood review, but they drew a very careful line between, we are investigating the climate and the culture at Fort Hood. There is a completely separate investigation that's still looking into Vanessa Guillen. And so the independent review committee was careful to draw that line. Vanessa Guillen's name comes up 20 times in the 150 page report. So there's definitely a significant amount of pointing out that this investigation kind of stemmed from the the outrage over Vanessa Guillen's murder. But there's still a lot of questions that this review did not answer because there's a specific investigation going into that. So now that this review has been released, people are getting fired. What happens next? What happens at Fort Hood? What, what happens to Fort Hood? The Secretary of the Army has created yet another task force. This task force, the People First Task Force, has been tasked specifically with implementing all 70 of the recommendations that the report made. The report committee even said during the briefing yesterday that they were surprised that all 70 of the recommendations were accepted, because that's a significant amount of recommendations. They have already started. Obviously, we've seen those 14 leaders be relieved or suspended. We've seen a new absent without leave policy go into effect. And this task force is meant to implement all 70 of the recommendations before March 2021. Has the president, has the incoming presidential administration said anything, the Biden camp, have they said anything about this particular report or what they plan to do uh, when they come into power? So the Biden administration has not said anything specifically about the report that was just released, but Joe Biden was pretty vocal throughout the, the early stages of the Vanessa Guillen situation, calling for justice, saying that it was completely unacceptable. There has been a lot of delay when it comes to Biden and the Department of Defense. As we've seen, we waited for longer than we planned to for him to announce his pick for the next Secretary of Defense, which he just did this week. So it seems like Biden is being very careful with who he appoints within the Department of Defense, who, how he is viewed with the Department of Defense. So he has not yet released any sort of statement regarding the most recent um, report release. Where do we go from here uh, in regards to Fort Hood, in regards to these reports, um, next, the, the, we have a new Department of Defense secretary being um, declared by Biden or appointed by Biden when his time comes in. Where do we go from here, Elizabeth Howe? We can only hope that this most recent reckoning against military sexual assault and sexual harassment that was sparked by Vanessa Guillen will actually go somewhere. This is not the first time that we have faced these challenges head on and said, we are going to fix them. Hopefully it is the last. They, the Secretary of the Army seems extremely committed to the recommendations that the report made to implementing change at Fort Hood and throughout the Army. And now we can just hope that this is it once and for all, as everyone's been saying since the beginning of the Vanessa Guillen situation, that this is it. This is the end. It ends now. And we can only hope. Elizabeth Howe, where can we find out more about you and your articles at Connecting Vets? You can follow me on Twitter at ECB Howe. 
thank you again for uh, doing this and uh, staying on top of this uh, really ugly situation that's developing. And I have a feeling this is not the end of the conversation. There is way more that's going to be happening in the very in the next couple of weeks, probably. That does it for this episode of The Back Brief. You can find me on Twitter at Rod Pod Rod. This show is available on YouTube and everywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Don't forget to check out our other uh, podcasts like uh, CBS Ion Vets, Vet Story. All of that is available and ready for you to go check it out at ConnectingVets.com. I'm Rod Rodriguez, and I'll see you at the next episode.